welcome to Linux Action News, our weekly take on Linux and the open source world. This is episode 89, recorded on January 20th, 2019. I'm Chris. And I'm Joe. Hello, Joe. It's good to be connected with you. And let's kick things off with a story that just keeps taking twist after turn after twist. It's it's almost like a like a piece of fiction at this point. It's it's the long twisted story of MongoDB and the bit of rejection it's getting from major Linux distributions this week. Yeah, it all started when they changed their license to the server-side public license, the SSPL. And then last week we reported on Amazon rolling their own MongoDB compatible database called DocumentDB. And now it's gone from bad to worse for MongoDB because it's being removed from a few major distros. Yeah, so the ball really got rolling when both Fedora and Debian announced they would no longer be including it in their distribution. And the uh, quote from Tom Calloway over at Fedora is this, it is the belief of Fedora that the SSPL is intentionally crafted to be aggressively discriminatory towards a specific class of users. Well, it's not an open source license, is it? So they can't have it in open source projects. Well, the MongoDB logic kind of goes like this. This is a quote from their CTO and co-founder, Uh, And Elliot explained, we believe that in today's world, linking has been superseded by the provision of programs as services and the connection of programs over networks as the main form of a program combination. With the GPL and all that, a lot of open source licenses are really built around the idea of if you link to them. But linking, they argue, is going away and rehosting things and connecting to it over the network is the new normal. He goes on to say, it is unclear whether existing copyleft licenses clearly apply to this form of program combination, and we intended the SSPL to be an option for developers to address this uncertainty. Well, that is fair enough. They do make a lot of good points, but that doesn't change the fact that the way they've chosen to solve this problem is by making a license that isn't open source. And so these distros have no other choice but to remove it. Talk about a rock and a hard place with MongoDB here, because they have the open source community in the form of the distributions, essentially being forced to turn their backs on MongoDB. And at the same time, on the commercial end of the spectrum, you've got companies like Amazon launching DocumentDB, which gives a very compelling commercial alternative to MongoDB. It's it's a rough time to be that project right now and to be that company. Well, except that you do have to ask, is anybody who's running a serious instance of MongoDB really using the version in the repos of their distro, or are they using the MongoDB repos? And realistically, that's probably the case with these major deployments. So removing it from these distros isn't going to be a huge issue for a lot of the bigger enterprise installations. So maybe they're not that bothered, but I I don't know, maybe it will hurt adoption in the first place. Mm. Seems like an opportunity for a snap package, Joe. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, we don't know whether it's going to actually be removed from Ubuntu yet, uh, but it sort of seems fairly likely that it will. Although with the ZFS thing, you know, they've put that in Ubuntu and got away with it, for want of a better word. True. It's not in main Debian. Well, much like Fedora pulling, it means it's getting pulled from RHEL. Uh, it seems pretty likely that if it's getting pulled from the repository, it's probably getting pulled from downstream Ubuntu. But you're right. They have shown in the past they're perfectly happy uh, adding their own thing and doing their own thing. So it's possible it'll stick around. Yeah. Or they might use this opportunity to snap it up. I mean, really, it does seem like a perfect opportunity. Yeah. And then it'll be available on multiple distros, so you'd be able to get it relatively easily in Fedora, for example. Well, speaking of ZFS on Linux, there has been a lot of ups and downs recently. So we covered all of the projects rebasing on the ZFS on Linux implementation. That was huge news. But then shortly after that, news came out that in the new 5.0 version of Linux, the new kernel, the ZFS on Linux project could no longer build due to some kernel changes that were made by the core developers. Yeah, and there was nothing short of hostility coming from Greg KH regarding ZFS. Hostility? Yeah, okay. I mean, definitely annoyance. There was there was lines in there like, my tolerance for ZFS is pretty non-existent. That's, uh, that's pretty straightforward. He then later on followed up with, sorry, no, we do not keep symbols exported for non-in-kernel users. And then another kernel developer chimed in saying that people should go use FreeBSD if they care about ZFS. <laughs> so there was some back and forth, yes. 
I think really Greg's annoyance was at the end of the day, like Sun made it impossible to run it on Linux intentionally. They were trying to make it hard. And so he his position is, is why am I bending over backwards to make a file system work? Even, he says, even if it's the best file system to ever grace this planet, that's fantastic. But given that the creators of that code placed it under a license that was specifically designed not to be compatible with Linux, to prevent it from ever being used on Linux, well, you can see why I really don't care about it. Why would I? He writes. So yeah, okay. I mean, that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a <laughs> Yeah, I suppose so. But there is a workaround, although it may possibly impact performance. Well, essentially, it just disables the vector instructions that were being used that that, that got taken away, and um, that was that was to really just make checksumming faster. So I suppose there's a possibility there'll be some performance hit there, but I'm not sure. It's not clear if it's only at build time. I would not be surprised if we see some benchmarks soon that make it clear. But at some point, either at the build process or perhaps when doing file system checksums, there could be a performance hit. We just don't know yet. Well, I really hope there isn't a serious performance impact because we will never hear the end of it from the BSD people. <laughs> Can you imagine? No, it's based on Linux, but it runs best on FreeBSD. Well, let's keep talking about the BSDs just for a moment here on the Linux Action News Program and talk about Project Trident, which just had their first stable release. And for those of you that aren't keeping score at home, Project Trident is based on TrueOS. And TrueOS itself, at least at the time of this release, was based on FreeBSD 13 current. So I managed to install this, but I didn't manage to boot it. It looks from Twitter that you got on a bit better than I did. Yeah, I did. I've used it all morning, actually. Uh, I, I, it's funny, what I, I think what I said on Twitter was, I went in with kind of low expectations, just because I was expecting it to be a really minimal, cute desktop that wasn't really ready to go yet, and... You know, this is their first stable release here, and TrueOS is kind of still new, and it's all still kind of new. And I went in with low expectations, and I got that sensation that I used to get from distro hopping when I would move to a new distro that did things really differently, and it really impressed me. I got that sensation. And so I I think it's very competitive for a particular type of workload. It may still have some cooking it needs to do, but I was pretty impressed, Joe. It's funny that it reminded you of a time many years ago, because that was exactly the feeling I got. I didn't get as far as the desktop, but the whole experience around it felt like when I first got into Linux, like 10, 11 years ago, the, from the download speed of the ISO, which was somewhere around 200 kilobytes a second or whatever, it took hours and hours to download this four point whatever gigabyte ISO. And then the installer just felt very clunky and old school to me. And then the fact that you go through the installation and then just won't boot. And this is on a laptop that will run Triscoll very happily. It's just Intel, no NVIDIA or anything like that. So I was just not very impressed with it, really. And I've had a bit of criticism, I think, for being down on BSD generally, or the BSDs. And I don't think that's fair, because things like FreeBSD clearly have a place, and they are excellent at some things, like basically all of the hardware that IX System sells, for example, and you know, network gear and NASIS and stuff, it's absolutely perfect for that. But in terms of the desktop, this Trident really, I think, shows how far behind Linux they are. It's really a shame I, you didn't get to go all the way to the desktop and use it for a bit because I think one of, some of my notes on here are like uh, very much like XFCE. I think Joe would like this about it. First of all, it has a Windows 7 sort of workflow look and feel. And that's the first thing people said on Twitter. Is, oh, I thought that was Windows 7 for a moment. Yeah. It's a little old. It feels a little dated. That might be fine for a workstation, though. And it's got a few rough edges. Um, I've been on a VMware workstation kick, for better or for worse. And so on my system, like all of the bottom buttons of the installer get cut off. I get to see the very, 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 very top of the button. And the first two buttons just shut the thing down to a command line. It's like, all right, I'll try the other button. Same exact result. Like I had to just sit there and try the different buttons until I got the result I wanted. So it took me a while to get through the installer. But once I got it in, a couple of neat things stood out to me. Number one, their file manager is kind of cool. It's got built-in Git support. So you can do Git check-ins and uh, clone repos right in the file manager. Uh, pretty intelligently, they're using the LTS version of the Qt framework, version 5.12.0. And the Qt-based desktop itself is very lean. The Lumina desktop is fast. It's easily configurable. 
There is a control panel-like preferences area that has everything you'd want and not too much. And then, and I think maybe this just comes with all TrueOS-based systems, there's the TrueOS sysadmin panel, which reminds me of Yast Lite. It just does a few things like manage volume snapshots and boot environments and set up a few basic essentials about your computer, but that's it. And last but not least, their update management tool ties in with those boot environments and ZFS snapshots. They're using ZFS in really clever ways that you don't even have to configure as an end user to enable things like software rollbacks if your updates don't work, including the entire boot environment. So if the kernel doesn't work or something gets borked with the boot manager, it can roll it back at a file system level for you. And it's just right there in the controls. You know, there's a mishmash of design looks here and there, and some things are a little odd, but everything's functional. And it's it performs great, and I completely forgot that I was on a BSD-based system. Oh, and it came with Telegram pre-installed, so I was happy. Telegram, right there, right there. Oh, very nice. You're making me want to actually give this another go and try and get it working, because I've had a good experience with Ghost BSD before with the Mate desktop, but this minimal Lumina desktop, I have tried not for a while, so I would like to give that another go, so... All right, I'll try it on a different machine and see if I can get that to work. Yeah, I think you might like it. It's it's very XFCE in a lot of ways, and but in just a very functional kind of way too. And one other thing that's kind of nice is they have the App Cafe, which is a sort of synaptic-like GUI package manager. And I could install things like Mumble and the Fish Shell in seconds. Just I typed in Mumble, hit enter, showed up, installed it, and downloaded all the Cute Forward dependencies required and everything loaded perfectly fine. Same with the fish shell, in seconds. Are you really selling this to me? Because Synaptic-like is how I want all my GUI software managers to be. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was peak package management software, I think. <laughs> yeah, exactly, before all the bloat and everything. All right, I'm definitely going to have to give this a go then. Well, if you want something really different, Android x86 has a pretty significant release this week. It's 8.1 R1, And there's several things in this that actually make it, I would say, ready for the desktop. I know it always kind of has been getting closer and closer, but now there's like things like a proper taskbar and all that stuff. Yeah, I've been following the development of this, and this is based on Android 8.1 Oreo, so it is one version behind. Yes. But then most phones are, it's hard Android development. You can't really criticize them too much for it. And I've got a touchscreen laptop, a little 11-inch Vivo book, and that's what I always test this on. And again, as usual, worked perfectly on there. And you've got that choice between either a touch-based interface like standard Android or more of a traditional desktop interface with a taskbar and menu and everything that's more mouse-based. And also worth noting, Joe, freeform window modes. You can drag windows around. They're not all full screen, too. Yeah, so it really is a desktop-like experience. Why you'd want to do that... I don't know, it's just (laughs) something of a curiosity, really, to me. Uh, Surely no one can be actually using this as their daily machine. Maybe for like a kiosk or appliance. Maybe it's like in a a business where you want people to fill out information when they come in. I don't know. I'm just trying to think how I use this. Uh, I like it. I like messing around with it. I use it for about a good solid couple of hours every release. And and I'm like, okay, good enough. But I actually couldn't get this one to boot. Uh, Maybe it's VMware Workstation. I was trying everything out in VMware Workstation. So maybe that's the issue. Um, So I didn't actually get to try it. Did you... Get it to boot and try it? Yeah, yeah, I booted it on hardware on this Vivo book, yeah. Surely with all the laptops you've got lying around, I suppose you're on the road at the moment. Yeah, that's the thing. I'm on the road. Yeah. So I got limited hardware, so I was trying virtualization. Yeah. I, I don't know, I'm somewhat tempted to put this on the Vivo book because I don't really have that much use for that machine anymore because I recently bought a new laptop, and so it's kind of a bit redundant, and it would be nice, I suppose, to have essentially a large tablet with a keyboard. So may, maybe I'll give it a go. Yeah, I, I could I could see it um, on a like an x86 based tablet, and maybe it's one of the several OSs I have on there. Especially if you can have like a G apps equivalent, and now I can get the Netflix app, and I can like download videos for off- offline watching. Now I'm starting to see a use case here, but it's pretty backwoods. I, I don't really know. I don't really know how many users are interested. Maybe it's software development. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's for developers, Joe. Maybe it's for people to develop Android software on big fast computers. 
Maybe and testing and things. Um, it does have the Play Store pre-installed, mm, so yeah. uh, you can get things like Netflix. I didn't actually try Netflix, but I assume you can get that. You can certainly get most of the apps that I looked for. I'd be surprised if it works. There's probably some DRM thing in there that kicks in. Yeah, I'm gonna have to try that then. I kind of like talking about the other end of these uh, releases, though, like uh, Post Market OS. Yeah, which is, as the name suggests, an aftermarket firmware for primarily phones, but some ARM boards. And the idea of it is that you'll get 10 years of support with it, and it's not going to be based on Android. It's going to be aiming for at least mainline kernels and very long-term support for devices that otherwise have been completely abandoned by the original OEM. Yeah, and it looks like most of the user space Linux stuff is Alpine Linux right now. In fact, it's one of the things they're working on is they've been based on the development branch of Alpine Linux, which was good while they're developing software, but I meant about once a month everything would break in post-market OS. And they have been spending a lot of time just integrating Alpine Linux updates without really iterating on the operating system itself. So to avoid substantial breakage, as they put it, they are rebasing on the Alpine stable releases in the future. And then they will have a package branch, which is based on the next Alpine release, which is every six months or so. Essentially, they're just going to match Alpine's release cadence. But it's still very early days for this. It's nowhere near something like Ubuntu Touch, for example, in terms of actual usability. Yeah, so for example, like the Nexus 5, uh, they have a booting mainline kernel. They've got accelerated graphics. That's huge. And they can actually communicate with the cellular modem. But there's no working audio. There's no calls happening. I mean, it's really early days. And there's hundreds of devices that they currently support at various levels like that. In this update, they're adding a bunch of other devices, including like some cool tablet devices and some other ARM-based devices. But it's all various levels of support, and they're trying to get some basic goalposts in there, like get cell calls working and things like that. But so far, they haven't gotten there. I do like their honest approach, though. If you go to postmarketos.org, right there, the first thing you see is alpha version, calls don't work, etc., only suitable for hackers. So they're not trying to make any claims beyond that, which is good. But it does show how hard this is to make a proper Linux system work on ARM. Right, but flip this around for a moment, Joe, on its, on its head, and look at the Nexus 5. That's been completely abandoned by the original creator. There is zero support now from Google for the Nexus 5. At least post-market OS supports it to some degree. So you could make the argument that they're supporting it better than the original creator. Um, the thing is with projects like this, too, is they have time. They have time to work this out. There's not a huge commercial product that they have to get to market and they don't have to sell millions of copies of to be sustainable. It really is an open source project that can take its time to build something and eventually become something that can keep these devices going. And if they only get to maybe, say, a dozen or so that are fully supported, well, then they're better off than they would have been. Yeah, that's true. And you mentioned the Nexus 5 there. Of course, you can run lineage on that, but all the kernel and drivers and everything are seriously out of date and a potential security risk, whereas the whole point of post-market OS is to be up-to-date and secure. And I suppose that is a good priority to have if you use that as a foundation, and then once they get it up to a point where it is working really well with an interface like Plasma Mobile, for example, then you'll have something that's actually really worth using in the long term. Did you see in this update, they also talk about getting XFCE4 running on the Librem 5 dev kit board. Yeah, I did see that, and uh, it warmed my heart to see XFCE running there. Although, in the photo that's in this post, you have to scroll down a little way to see it. If you expand that photo, you see something quite alarming, and that is a fan attached to this Librem 5 dev kit. Whoa, holy rotations, Batman. <laughs> that is, that. it looks also like it's been wired on there. Perhaps they wired it. Maybe they had to overclock it. Let's give the benefit of the doubt here, because... This, first of all, this dev board is large. It's it's like four or five Raspberry Pis next to each other large. It's it's big. And then there is a, what would you call that? A, a 40 millimeter fan? That's a pretty small fan. Might even be 20. It's it's a, it's one of those real high-pitched whiners. Yeah. Um, and it has been suspended with stiff wire over the CPU heatsink. Yeah. In what appears to be a desperate attempt to cool the CPU on the dev board. You know, Joe, though, I got to say, looking at the screenshot here, they have 
the info up on the screen, and the CPU is running at 1.5 gigahertz, which, double check me, but I think that's the clock speed it's supposed to be running at. Yeah, I think that is stock, so yeah, it's not even overclocked. That is very alarming then. Could it be that PureOS will be more efficient somehow? And maybe that's something that I don't know. Post market need to work on. Mm. I would say this: uh, if you want to know what we're talking about, go to linuxactionnews.com/slash89, and then go to the post market OS link. Scroll down in this post and look at this photo of the XFCE desktop, and then let us know what you think. Linuxactionnews.com/slash contact. Legitimately, if I didn't know any better, I'd say this is this is a really bad sign. But you know, this could be anything. <laughs> it could be anything. So we'd love to. Have somebody talk us off the cliff. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm hoping to speak to Todd at some point soon, the CEO, Todd Weaver of Purism, um, because we agreed a hot date on Valentine's Day. It's true. That's true. Uh, also, by the way, just uh, one more thing on uh, PostMarket OS. They also got Unity 8 working on top of PostMarket, uh, which is just, I don't know. They say it runs great. <laughs> I'm sure it does. It's a pretty neat project. Uh, and I love the idea of... It's Alpine based. It's not necessarily like some clone of Android that they're trying to flash onto these phones, which may actually be a lot easier. It is its own unique thing that they're trying to breathe 10 years of life into a device after it's been abandoned by a manufacturer. And if they can get, if they can even get that for a handful of devices, I think it's going to be a project that is cherished. Well, a project that was cherished by some people was the Firefox test pilot program, which Mozilla have decided is no more. I read this post, Joe, and I, I feel like if you're a student going into business communications, you should go read this because it is a masterpiece in reframing failure as an epic success. <laughs> I'll give you a couple of quick choice quotes here, because keep in mind, test pilot was starting to get a bad name for a lot of, well, most people consider it a, an advertising mechanism, fair or not. And so it was time to get to get far, far away from it. But this is how it's framed. They say, we're proud to announce today that we're evolving our approach to experimentation even further. Test Pilot was designed to harness the energy of our most passionate users. Test Pilot performed better than we could have ever imagined. <laughs> As a result of this program, we're now in a stronger position. So today, we are announcing that we will be moving to a new structure that will demonstrate our ability to innovate in exciting ways. As a result, we're closing the test pilot program as we've known it. Because it's such a success, Joe, it's been so incredibly blow the doors off successful, we're ending it. Well, to be fair, they do say now that everyone is responsible for maintaining the culture of experimentation capitalized Firefox has developed through this process. So they're basically saying that instead of just having this small test pilot program, now all the experiments will be <laughs> part of Firefox. Yeah. And it sounds like it's actually a realignment inside Mozilla, too, because here's the, here's the wording you're going off. If they say, migrating to a new model doesn't mean we're doing fewer experiments. In fact... We're doing even more, with an exclamation mark. The innovation process that led to products like Firefox Monitor are no longer the responsibility of a handful of individuals, but rather the entire organization. So read that as there was just a team that was responsible for test pilot and tried a few things, and now we're just making that a company-wide thing or a group-wide thing. So you're right. It's it's not only going to be a change in how Firefox delivers these features, but it's going to be a structural change inside the Mozilla group too. It just seems like a bad idea to me. It was a great idea before that you could opt in to this program where you get these new features and you could test them out and help out the project with it, but they weren't inflicting these potentially bad features onto the entire user base. And okay, they can do it with sort of staged rollouts and stuff, but it just seemed like that was a great idea before and to get rid of it and move to a culture of experimentation just doesn't seem right to me. Yeah, I mean, I got to assume they're going to do some sort of staged rollout. They don't outline that in here. But I think it's safe to say the test pilot program caught a few bad ideas before they rolled out to everybody. Yeah. And that's valuable. So I hope they do something like that. It would be wise to do that, and I would imagine they're going to. But you're right. It, to me, it seems like it's extremely precarious times for Firefox with the changes coming to Microsoft Edge and the total dominance that WebKit and Blink now seem to be approaching. 
Firefox is in a bad position. And this kind of, all of this, from the way they communicate it to the things that they do, they're not making a compelling case. And there's so many basics that they still get wrong on the different operating systems, on Windows, on Linux, and on Mac OS. They fail to fully integrate with those host operating systems in a way that it makes Firefox often the third browser for a lot of people. And that's a really bad position. I think they're really screwed because the way they communicate is so screwed. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't connect with any of us anymore. They, they've completely lost us in the message. And their priorities are so big and their goals are so lofty and their market share is so small and it just seems to be getting smaller. I feel like it is essentially end of days for Firefox unless people actively start making a choice to run this browser. I'm, I'm using it right now to do this show, um, but I, I, can't, I can't make a difference alone, and a handful of Linux users aren't going to make a difference either. It has to be on the commercial platforms, and that's just not happening. Man, you paint a very bleak picture for someone who's sitting here staring at Firefox right now. I really hope that they can turn it around because I'd like it as a browser. I prefer to use a completely open source free software browser, and I don't want to have to use Chrome or even Chromium, really. I, I just, I've just i used Firefox for years and years and years, and I, I just want to keep using it. So I really hope you're wrong. I do too, because, um, in fact, I hope I'm really wrong, because it's not just they need to survive. They need to have a measurable, important percentage of the market. So that way they have a real seat at the table. They have power and leverage in the conversation about web standards. And they don't have that if they don't have a sizable market share. So it's not just like they have to be surviving. They have to be thriving to really be successful. And I think maybe I'm losing faith in the side of Mozilla that doesn't necessarily have its hands on the code as much. I don't know. You just look at all the stories we've covered. But hopefully I'm wrong. Time will tell, Joe. Well, at least they're killing Adobe Flash support in uh, the upcoming Firefox 69. It's funny that you have to say Adobe Flash now. That's how irrelevant it is. You have to kind of specify <laughs> which Flash you're talking about. I guess so. <laughs> I mean, it feels like this has been a slow-moving development, but the announcement from Adobe itself was back in 2017 that it planned to push Flash into an end-of-life state. So there's sort of been this 2017 announcement with a 2020 roadmap objective for Adobe. And so this is actually right in step with that. In fact, they're even coming in a little early. Firefox 69 is scheduled to be released on September 9th. So if you are in a corporation using Firefox where Flash is still relevant, I know that's also in, in education. Um, my, my, for example, my kids' schools, Firefox on the machines, and they're using Flash apps. <laughs> Flash apps, Joe. So like they're going to have to brace themselves for this change. And uh, it'll be on September 9th The Firefox 69 ships on time. Well, it's not just with Firefox. It's happening with Chrome as well. Flash is just on its way out. So institutions like your kid's school that are using Flash, this is just going to force their hand. They're going to have to go another route, and it's going to end up costing a lot of money probably to develop these apps and games and you know educational games and stuff. So is the world, though, of software, Joe. In fact, it's a reason why schools should be using open source software. Let's be honest, this is where free software is extremely strong, especially in the education sector. And I'll note it's, you know, not just Flash, a lot of great plugins. The, the whole Netscape API for plugins is being deprecated. And it's just time to go. It's old. It's insecure. And it, this, has had, this has been a massive transition for Firefox to make. And in the day and age of HTML5 and everything we've got now with web apps and WebAssembly, like I just, there's no excuse. Just switch to something else. And if you're going to switch, a little bit of Linux Action News advice, switch to free software. Here's a tagline, Joe. This is from Linux Action News. Everybody out there can take it. To the, it's all free to the community. The tagline is this. You migrate to free software, and you only have to migrate once. Boom. The sales write themselves. Yeah, let's stick it on a T-shirt. <laughs> I like that idea. You should do that real quick, Joe, before we publish this. Or if somebody out there does that, just give us a cut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in the meantime, if you've been listening for quite a while, you know the drill. But if you're new here, linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get new episodes of this year's show. And go to linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch with us. We'll be back next Monday with our weekly take on the latest Linux and open source news. I am at Chris LAS. I'm at Joe Rissington. 
Thank you for joining us, and we will see you next week. See you later. Thank you.